This presentation is a joint production between Backyard to Table and Morton Library. Backyard to Table offers workshops and demonstrations and garden builds to our Hudson Valley neighbors. We demonstrate how to create and maintain regenerative and organic food gardens for resilience. I'm so appreciative that you're all here tonight um, to hear about biomimicry, which is something that is a discipline that is growing very rapidly. I'm very happy to hear that. Um, and biomimicry is really about design solutions. Um, and that's why we call the program um, Solve Human Design Problems. Jeanine Bendis always said, most failures, most problems are nothing matter than core design or a design flaw. So I'm gonna begin the program by asking everybody to think about and then put into the chat box if you know the connection between this $100 bill and this gorgeous iridescent beetle. So go ahead. And again, this is one of the other challenges of a um, virtual presentation, the wait time and people typing. Um, so if anybody would like to think about bill is made from beetle parts, that's some, many people think that. Mm -hmm. Any other connection, ink, mm -hmm. anything you could think that would be a connection between this iridescent beetle. No idea. <laughs> no idea. Absolutely. Okay. Anybody else? The color and the type of ink. Okay. It, it definitely does have something to do with the coloring. And it has to do with, and it's similar to this bird that you see on my, uh, so on my title slide, another iridescent of uh, colored animal. It has to do with what we call structural color. Humans and nature make color very, very differently. Um, we make color and all, you know, we, I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody, I love color, but our color comes from pigmentations, which are incredibly toxic and incredibly polluting. And in fact, where many, most of our clothing is being made nowadays in Southeast Asia, they're having a huge problem with water pollution due to the pollutants that come out of the clothing factories. So that is pigmentation. Nature makes it very differently. Make, nature makes it through structural color. And what structural color is, is if you take, the, for instance, this bluebird up and you look at its feather under a high powered microscope, you're not gonna see a flat feather. You're going to see a multi-dimensional structure that has many, many layers. Some of those layers are thin, some are thick, some are far apart, some are close. And what happens is, because of that structure, some of the light um, is reflected and some is absorbed. The light that is reflected is the color that you see. And that's what gives the iridescence. So you can see that the light being reflected with this bird obviously is blue. And that's how iridescence is created. And you see iridescence throughout the natural world. Interesting, uh, we were wondering in a teacher workshop that I ran many years ago, what would happen if you destroyed the structure? So I took a peacock feather and a hammer and started banging on it. I was really impressed, surprised, amazed at how hard it was to destroy the structure. Once I did though, we looked at it and all you saw was a brown spot. So the structure being gone, you didn't have any color. So what does that have to do with the $100 bill? And when I do a live presentation, I, you know, I have my little trusty $100 bill here. And I'm going to tell you when I work with young people, I, this gets them. I have them in the palm of my hands. Um, and if you can, here's my homework assignment to you. If you can get a hold of a $100 bill, you can even go to the bank. Actually, I did this uh, two years ago when I was bringing money back from Citra Claus, I had a $100 bill and I did this whole lesson on biomimicry in the bank. Even the bank president came out to here. So if you look at the 100 in the lower right-hand corner, if you, on the screen here, you'll see, I've got a circle around it. If you look at that, you'll notice it has different color, okay? And if you move the $100 around in the light, and you're not gonna see it on the computer, but you're gonna notice different colors, anywhere from red, copper, yellow, blue, green. That's because we're no longer printing money. We're actually weaving it to prevent counterfeiting. So, our treasury department is, is using biomimicry in the production of money. So structural color 
is how nature makes color. And in doing so, there's no pollutants going into our environment. So that's biomimicry. Um, what, from that description, do you guys want to put into the chat box your thought, a little bit of a definition of biomimicry? Anyone want to give that a try? What is biomimicry to you? What have you heard? What have you read? Um, or what can you surmise from what I have just said? And for those of you who have just joined us, I, I invite you, if you're comfortable with being um, recorded, I'd love to see your lovely faces. It's very hard to do a presentation just to a camera screen. So I, I do like to see faces whenever possible, if you're comfortable. Um, anybody wanna try for bio Using natural solutions to solve problems? Mm -hmm. Nature inspired design, mimicking systems. That, ooh, somebody's been doing some reading. Yes. Yes, okay. So um, many different ways mimicking a copy and what nature for other purposes. Yep. Excellent. So yes, innovation inspired by the natural world. It's and it's really something very important to reflect on. It's a very different way of looking at nature and our role in the natural world, different from how we've looked at the natural world in the past. And it is an incredibly rapidly growing discipline where we're looking at copying nature's strategies, patterns um, to create more sustainable technology for people. Now, the core idea behind biomimicry is that organisms that are here, what's here today survived on this planet because they figured out how to survive within the operating principles of the planet. They had many of the same challenges that we're struggling with. Energy, food production, climate control, um, transportation, move, movement around. All these organisms have figured out how to do that, but within the operating conditions of the planet. And that's very, very important. They have figured out how to live here, maintain our systems in a healthy way. The goal of biomimicry is not only to create products, but to create processes and policies that are well adapted over the long haul. And the key idea in bio, I'm sorry, not the key idea, the, the core question that we ask is when we're, when we're looking at a, a situation is how would nature solve this? Not how do I get my ideas from somewhere else? How, how do you solve it? It's how does the natural world solve this problem? Because biomimicry is looking at the challenges and problems that we're facing and trying to figure out how to solve them. So I, I want to though stop for a minute and because there's many different bio terms out there and I just want to define them for you because it's really important because there's some key differences. Uh, bio utilization we've been doing since the beginning of time, consuming natural resources. Something newer is bioengineering, you know, the genetic engineering that's going on. Biomorphism is not biomimicry, although some people think it is. It's a, some type of resemblance to something in nature. Uh, if you remember the Olympics in China was eight years ago, 12 years ago now, when they had their big um, arena and they called it the bird's nest because it looked like a bird's nest. So that's very superficial resemblance. Bio-inspired is very close to biomimicry and they're often interchangeable, but there's a really key difference because biomimicry is innovations inspired by the natural world. However, we also design those innovations with the operating principles of the planet in mind. Are they addressing sustainability and human well being? Bio inspired doesn't usually do that. It's usually some type of resemblance, uh, mimicking maybe form, only form. So, you know, the difference would be. In biomimicry, instead of just looking at um, the visual and aesthetic qualities of our world, biomimicry, we use life's blueprints, chemistry from nature, um, and ecosystem strategies to meet very specific human needs. So instead of just designing a pair of slippers that looks like a butterfly, we might instead say, hmm, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but how do butterflies stay clean? How do they stay dry in the rain? Well, interesting, their wings have nanostructures on them 
little tiny bumps, which is a very common design structure in nature. And those bumps do not allow the water, it allow, it, they shed the water. So the water does not stay and soak in and it also sheds dirt. So could you imagine designing a pair of slippers that maybe didn't look like butterflies, but that didn't get dirty and never got wet when you went outside in the rain to get the mail. So that's really what biomimicry is about. And I also mentioned it's about shifting how we look at the natural world. And this is where we're gonna try this new, for those of you who just joined us late, we're gonna try, because usually I do this, it's very interactive. So I wanted to add at least one interactive component. This is Jamboard we're gonna to go to, and I have this link, it's in the chat board, correct, Margo? Yes, it, it's in the chat box. It's if, if you go into the chat box, um, and personally, I'll stop sharing my screen and Susie's gonna start sharing her screen. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is, you know, typically when you see a, tr a tree or think about a tree, or if you're in school, learn about a tree, what do we typically think about, learn about trees? So the way you the, would do this is if you, oh, you can't see my mouse. If you, over in the left is a menu. When you get into Jamboard, open up that link, it's gonna open up a separate uh, a screen in your browser. And then over on the left, you see a menu and under the, the circle with the arrow in it is a little sticky note. You click on that and I'll ask Susie, since this is her screen in a minute, we'll, when we see, oh, we see you coming in. Yay, welcome, this is working. I haven't done this as a facilitator. I've done this, use this board in other virtual workshops that I've been in. So we've got two, four, five. If you don't feel that you can get into um, Jamboard, you don't have the ability, you can answer that question in a chat box. When you think of a tree, what do you think about? And then Susie will take your answers and put them on sticky notes themselves. So if you're looking over in the, the left-hand side of the screen, that little white menu bar, Right below that black circle with the arrow is a sticky note. Click on that. It'll bring up a sticky note. You type in, go ahead, Susie, up, click on that. And then type in, when you think of a tree, what do you think of? You can just do a word or branches, okay. And then hit save. And there you go. You can add more or you can just put one. You can change the color. So go ahead and give it a try, everybody. Okay. Homes for creatures, roots, life. Any, anything else you can think of? Let's see, where's the chat box? Clean air. You know, I think there's a couple that are on top of each other, Susie. Yeah, there we go. My five-year-old says shade and help us breathe. Yes, for sure. Anything else that, about trees that help us use trees for? Carbon sequestering? Mycelium root system? Yes, yes. Help us breathe, yes. Iophilia. Okay. World Wide Web, yes, the, the original World Wide Web. If you don't know anything about that, um, it's fascinating. We're, we're really just learning. Our technology is allowing us to learn so much more about the natural world, just as we're destroying it. Um, the, the tree root system is interconnected and they actually communicate with each other. If a particular tree in an area is, is not healthy, the trees send nutrients and energy to it. So it's a very complicated system. See, we have birds, I feel like make apples and syrup, yes, yes, and peaches and um, protector of the forest. Oh, I love that, that's wonderful. 
carbon sequestering, I see in the chat box, beauty, habitat, cooling, carbon sink, longevity. Excellent, yes. What else do we have here? Food, food for mm, all of us, food for nature, yes. Yes, I call the mother nature's apartment houses when they die, they, they go back into the system. So, so these are all different ways that we think about trees. So Susie, if you want to stop um, sharing, and I'll go back to sharing mine. Hold on, everybody. This is a little bit more. Oh, no, I did. I forgot to start sharing. Sorry, everybody. Um, share screen. Yes. Okay. There we go. So you named many different things that we tend to think about um, in here. Um, I can't, I'm trying to look. I don't know if anyone mentioned shade, the use of trees for furniture, for buildings, uh, for paper. Um, so there's a lot of ways that, you know, we use trees and how we look at trees as something that is there to take care of, serve, to be part of, they're part of the ecosystem, but they are definitely in service. In biomimicry, we shift that perspective from looking at trees as a source of stuff and maybe learning from them, but as a source of stuff to learning from them, a source of ideas. You know, we never, when we, when we look for ideas, we tend to go to each other and nature is filled with brilliant ideas, like a, like a giant encyclopedia of information. So what ideas can we learn? Uh, leaves, they create solar energy without toxins. And they've actually, a team of scientists, I think it was at MIT, actually created the first um, solar uh, unit that produces energy and light in the same way leaves do. They have a long way to go, but it's a potential form of producing energy, much less polluting and toxic than the photovoltaic solar that we now have. The xylem, of course, um, I mean, the trees pump water up from the roots to the very tip top of the trees, hundreds of feet every single day without any pumps. I don't know about you, but I've never heard any pumps running in, in the woods. So this is amazing. What an incredible feat to be able to pump without pumps. Right now, there are teams of engineers around the world that are, they know how it's done, but trying to mimic it. The team that figures it out has a multi-billion dollar patent. Um, the canopy, I don't know if you know, trees are basically the humidifiers of the planet. They're rehumidifying the, the uh, air on a daily basis. The structure of trees is fascinating. Um, just the right amount of um, material and angles to create a structure that doesn't have stress on it. And it's also self-assembling. They're produced without any fossil fuels. And of course, it's a carbon sink, storing carbon. Now, if you notice, I have in um, blue here, certain words, capture energy, transport. These are functions, these are what we call in biomimicry functions. And it's functions that we look at for design ideas. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And by the way, if anyone has any questions, please throw them in the chat box. Again, I'm, I'm doing this, I don't even have your, right now your picture, your faces up because I wanna be able to see my slides. Um, so I wanna take a step back really to understand why biomimicry uh, and how it's so different. So it's really human systems versus natural systems. To do that, we're going to do a quick activity. And I will not do a jam board. We weren't sure how successful it would be. Um, but I don't know if anyone has done a systems app. It's basically like a recipe of what ingredients goes into um, a particular item. So we put the name of the item in the center and then all the inputs, which are all the resources, the natural resources, all the materials, all everything that goes into the production of steel. And then the other part of the systems map is what do we get from it? So if you wanna dive into the chat box and 
start adding what are some of the inputs? What are some of the ingredients that goes into making steel? And what are some of the outputs from the production of steel? I'm trying to find my chat box. No, here we go. Okay. I seem to have lost my chat box. Um, Margo, I seem to have somehow lost my chat box. So if you want to share what's in the chat box. Uh, nothing's in the chat box just yet. Oh, nobody wants to take any thoughts on what goes into it. Um, th there is quite a bit there. Okay. Can you, can you read them? I see fire, heat, um, oh, sorry, iron. Sorry. Iron and heat, iron ore. Pollution. That's definitely an out. Yes. Yep. Sorry, right. I missed one. So this is very, very basic. There's certainly a lot more uh, inputs that goes into making steel. But there's some basic, really heavy hitters in the production of steel. And the outputs. You can see there, steel being one of them, but look at all the pollutants that come out of the production of steel. Very important material, but lots of inputs from all around the world. A lot of destruction goes into mining this material to take it out of the earth, to transport it somewhere else to make the steel. So now I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing, A, systems map of a spider's web. What are the inputs and what are the outputs? Go ahead and do that. And then once they start going in, you can find them. I, it must be behind my PowerPoint. What are some of the inputs and outputs of a spider's web? Energy. Energy, okay. Insects for eating for fuel. Mm -hmm. Silk. The spider. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Pretty basic. Some chopped up fly bits, old spider web, and water basically goes into the production. Yep. Water. Yeah. It's a food. food. Go ahead. What's that? Uh, it's a device to catch food. Yeah. It is yeah. The spider web. So you, you can really see the difference between how we make one of the strongest materials on earth and how the spider makes one of the strongest materials in nature. Because you may say, why do you choose a spider's web? Steel is so much stronger. But relative to size, spider web is one of the strongest materials in the natural world. Try this sometime. Get a hold of a spider web and very gently tug, very gently. You're going to see what's called intense, really incredible tensile strength. Um, and if you, we could make a spider web the size of my pinky here, it would actually stop the fighter jets that land on those battleships. That's how strong it is. So the difference then in human operating systems versus Earth's operating systems. Humans are independent systems located all around the planet. So we're shifting and shipping things all over the planet. Earth systems, everything is integrated into the cyclical process locally. Inputs, lots of heat, energy, toxic chemicals, resources from around the world, natural world, local material and water, least amount of energy and materials. Outputs, huge amount of waste and pollution. Outputs in the natural world. This waste equals food in the natural world. Anything that's a waste gets consumed by something else in the natural world. So there's really, in the natural world, there's no such thing as waste. So we need to move from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. Is it possible? There are many people that believe it's possible. It's just a matter of 
re-looking at our systems and re-engineering and redesigning them. So let's look at some cases of, of bio-inspired biomimicry products to see how we are shifting in that direction. So I'm gonna put up here a, a slide. On the top of the slide are some organisms that have inspired the products underneath the dotted line. So above the dotted line are organisms, underneath are bio-inspired products. What do we have? We've got in the upper left corner, a stanocara beetle. We have a morpho butterfly. We have a shark. We have a bat, mussels, seals, and lotus leaf. Underneath, we have a cane. We have plywood. We have paint, some marine coating, a water collecting device, outer weather gear, and nail polish. What I'd love for you to do is to, in the chat box, tell us which organism you think inspired which product and why. So which organism inspired which product and why? And I'm going to have to have yes, I'll read report, read mm -hmm. them. So, which organism from the top inspired which product from below, and why? You know what? If you forgive me, I'm just going to try to go out of this for a second. I'm out of the PowerPoint, and um, see if I can find the chat box. Muscles and plywood, says Tara. The Muscles glue. and plywood, okay. Why is that? The glue, she says. Okay. I don't Beetle, know. the cane, the flexing capability. Here's my chat box. Um, I'm gonna close it. All right, now I'm gonna bring this back up, sorry. The, what was that? The beetle and the cane for the flexibility. The seal and the anorak. Someone else says seals inspired submarine coating. Okay. okay. And then we have the seal and the raincoat. The okay. Seal is popular. All the right. Fly and the nail polish. Okay. The shark and the submarine. Okay. Uh, being able to withstand pressure. Um, oh, that goes with the seals inspired submarine coating because they're being able to withstand pressure. Excellent. Well, really good thoughts. I think some, what I think I heard one or two that have the correct um, connections, but let's take a look at them and see which was inspired by which and why. So this is a water collecting device and we don't think about it here, but we're very fortunate. We don't have to worry about collecting water every day. Um, for those people who do, it can be a very time consuming, very difficult process. And so this device was inspired by this little guy, the Stenicara beetle, one of my favorite organisms on this planet. It's about the size of a dime. And um, take a look at his structure, his body. What do you notice about his body? Put that in the chat box. What things do you notice about his body? Or its body, we don't know if it's a female or a male. It's very bumpy. Yep, the bumps. Mm -hmm. On his back. Mm -hmm. Yep. All for its size. Mm -hmm. Very long legs relative to body size. Yep. Dome shaped. Mm -hmm. Another long legs. What about its head? What do you notice about its head? Anything? Point down, the head points down to capture and it's smoother than the body and it's separate. Okay. So the Stanicara beetle lives in one of the driest places on this planet. They get a 16th of an inch of rain a year. But this desert happens to be right next to the ocean. So every morning, cold damp air, hot dry air meet, and 
in the atmosphere, we have lots of condensation dew fog. So these little guys, you can actually go on YouTube and, and, and watch videos of this thing. They run up the, uh, the sand dunes, they turn their backs into the, um, the fog. And as the fog settles on their body, those bumps cause the moisture to form into balls. And those balls, of water roll down. Now remember it's, it's, you said its head was pointing down here. Its head is actually lower than the rest of its body. Interesting design. Well, because the water rolls down and that's how the Stanicara beetle gets his water every day. So, Dorna, can, you, can you spell the name of that beetle? Uh, S-T-E-N-E-R-A, I think it is, Stanicara. So this water collecting device, it's about this big, um, was designed. Notice the dome. Notice it's a little hard to see, but there are actually bumps in it. And it's designed for um, individuals to be able to put that at night. And in the morning, they can co collect it. And there's enough water in the reservoir right here to provide drinking water for that individual for a day. So that is all inspired by this little Stenicara beetle. I, oh, interesting. Another um, product here is paint. And this paint is very different. It was inspired by the lotus leaf. Now you may wonder what the heck does paint have to do with lotus leaves? Well, a lotus leaf, if you look at the surface, seems to be very, very smooth. But take a look at that picture. You see how the water is just repelling off the leaf and flowing down. And see how the water is just all collecting in one stream. The lotus leaf actually lives in very muddy conditions. There's no way they should be as clean as they are. What happens is when it rains, those all the water droplets hit the surface, form a ball, and they do that because the lotus leaf surface is not smooth. It's made up of millions, billions of very tiny microscopic nanobumps, which I said before is a very common design structure in the natural world. And when water hits those nanobumps, it forms those balls. Remember the same thing on the Santa Clara beetle, rolls across the surface of the leaf. And you can see from that image on the lower right corner, actually collects dirt. It's a self-cleaning surface. So this company, Lotus and Paint, thought, hmm, I wonder if we could possibly create a paint that would be create a self-cleaning uh, surface. And I'm gonna try this um, here for you can see. I have a surface that's been painted with lotus and paint. And when it rains, and I'm going to simulate rain with my little handy uh, atomizer bottle here. And when it rains, you can see what happens to the dirt. It, the rain balls up and the dirt flows off. So this Lotus and Paint is really the fastest growing paint line in this company. I have friends who, paint, who live in the Florida Keys, and I don't know if you have you been down there. They have a lot of, their, their ground is mostly sand, and when it rains, it rains really heavy there, and the heavy rain hits the sand, and it, it, the sand splashes up on the side of the house. And my friend's husband just really hates having a dirty house, so he was out there, cleaning the house with his hose. But the Keys are also a desert. They have a huge water issue. So um, they painted their house with lotus and paint. And it's amazing. Never had to clean it again. The, the, whenever it rains, it just washes off the side of the house. So you can read about lotus and paint. There's a video there. If you just Google lotus and paint, you can actually watch simulated videos of the self-cleaning surface that it has created. Somehow or another, I, I, this is why I hesitate before, I'm not sure why, but this, this slide is sort of out of order. 
Um, this is a, a, uh, also a self-cleaning and also a water collecting um, surface. Going back to the Stanacara beetle, um, they're putting these fog nets up in areas with a lot of fog, including the San Francisco Bay area. Water is trapped in these nets and it flows down into these tubes, which then flow into collecting um, barrels. And the water is being used by farmers and, you know, and for other uses, but especially in uh, very arid areas, the Himalayas, you're seeing a lot of these. Okay, the outer um, weather, outdoor weather gear. Think about if you are a runner or outside and you're being very physically active, but it's cold outside, so you've worn something heavy. You start to perspire, and as you perspire, it gets wicked away from your body. But it, it, you know, it it your under your clothes, then you get very cold from it if if the wind hits you. So this particular company, it's a company in Great Britain, was considering designing a new line, but they were very aware of the problems of people, especially runners, perspiring and getting very cold. So they asked the question, you know, how does nature protect from weather? How does nature um, wick water away? And they came up with the mammal fur, which actually does two things. It actively repels water uh, and, and then pushes it away from the body. And so they created knit wax fabric which is made of two layers, the outer layers, uh, which will deflect the rain and the wind, and the inner layer, which they call the pump la uh, layer, that uses capillary action to move the perspiration away from the body. They have a whole line you can go on uh, on their Nick Wax on their website and purchase this uh, clothing from them. This cane was inspired by none other than the bat. Bats can't see like we can. They use sonar. We, there are people who cannot see either. They have limited, you know, they're either blind or they've got a limited sight. And so this cane was developed and it uses sonar so that somebody can freely walk about. As, um, they turn it on and as they're walking, as they, it, it emits a beep. And as they get close to something, the beep, beep, beep gets louder. Beep, 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 beep. So they know that they have come uh, close to something. And they're able to turn away and move into a freer space. So this cane is readily available. I actually used it when we were at a workshop. Um, it's, it's quite fascinating and, and really very liberating for people. It's, they are able to move about more independently. Somebody mentioned the plywood, and um, yes, it was inspired by muscles. Muscles can do something that we can't do, or glues fail. In, uh, they can stick in, in salty conditions, wet conditions, cold conditions, all of our glues fail in those conditions. So a, uh, a chemist was working and experimenting and actually figured out how the muscles are able to do that, and he mimicked the way, uh, using a soy um, uh, atom and mimicked that and created a glue called Pure Bond. And they have this line of plywood. And if you know anything about plywood with formaldehyde, it's incredibly toxic. You don't want it in your indoor space. So Pure Bond does not emit any toxic um, em emissions. So that it's much healthier to have in your space. You can. I have tried to buy it. Supposedly, I've seen it on Home Depot um, web websites and Lowe's websites, but I have not been able to find it around here. You can order it online. Uh, the um, submarine, submarines, any boats have problems with barnacles sticking to them. Barnacles slow everything down, use more energy to move. Uh, sharks actually, you look at the skin, it looks smooth. Their surface is not smooth. They actually have denticles on them. And those denticles um, prevent 
anything from attaching to it, including bacteria. So they're trying to create a coatings as well as paints that mimic the um, shark skin. You also, and so that nothing will attach to boats and submarines. And you also have a company that's created a shark that surface, which you can see it's just a piece of plastic under a microscope. It looks exactly what, like what you see on the screen and you can put it on surfaces. Bacteria will not um, congregate and gather on these surfaces. So you can imagine some of the applications for this, including door the coverings for doors, because that's where the germs are. Uh, and somebody mentioned nail polish, and yes, it has to do um, certainly with the morpho butterfly and anything with iridescent colors. People have figured out how to make a structure, how to add structure to paint and even makeup so that uh, we can develop iridescent colors. Now, something that wasn't up there is this um, paddle boat and sailboat fin, which you can see mimics the humpback whale fin. Uh, humpback whales do something they shouldn't be able to do. Um, they make really tight, their bodies are really big and lumbery. They make really tight, sharp turns. These uh, tubercles on their fins are what allow water to channel over and around. So this moves through the water much more efficiently. They've also created um, fans, large fans for industrial spaces that move through the air much more efficiently um, with less energy. I mentioned the butterfly earlier uh, and how it stays clean. They've created a fabric uh, that also repels water and dirt so you don't have to wash it um, in the way you wash normal clothing. So it is um, much more, um, you know, much less laundry detergent and pollutants going out into the atmosphere. This birds, I don't know if you know, millions of birds die each year flying into um, tall buildings. And that's because they don't see the glass in the building. All they see is a reflection of the sun. So this company created a glass that actually has, makes a spider web because spider webs, believe it or not, somebody studied this, birds don't find the spider webs because they are woven to reflect ultraviolet light, which the birds can see. So they mimic that into the um, glass. And you can see on the left is what we see, but on the right is what the birds see. So they see a giant spider web here um, and they will fly around it. And a lot of buildings in Europe are using this. The pangoline, um, take a look at its body structure. You'll see the, um, the scales on it and the curve there. This company was wanting to redesign their product. And they asked the question, how does nature protect? How does nature carry? And they came up with this organism and they redesigned their backpack. This is the Pangoline backpack right here, made of scales that are actually made of old tires. So they're recycling, we're using old tires. And it carries everything higher and closer to your body. So it's actually better for your back. The Pangoline backpack. It can carry quite a bit. You can see it right here. And you can order that online. It's made down in uh, Columbia, South America. Ford Motor Company is using biomimicry. They wanted to put a um, material in their cargo area to add extra strength, but they didn't want to add weight. And so they mimicked the shape of the honeycomb. This is a not even a product yet. It's in uh, design testing. Uh, spiders, um, they have an adaptation where in order to uh, attach a, a, uh, an insect they catch to their web, um, it has to be dry. So their, their secretion absorbs water from the surface of the in insect body, and then they can uh, put a little bit of glue on it so it, it can attach it right to the web. When um, surgery, well, I'm sorry, when surgery is done, it's very difficult to create a tight, tight seal on the body because of water, moisture on the surface. So they're mimicking the spider secretion in the development of a tape, a surgery tape. It's still in research, but they have had some success. 
Another adaptation having to do with medical devices is the use of the porcupine quill. And if you've ever had experience with that, you know how difficult and painful it is to take it out. Um, and in surgery, when they use staples and tacks, what happens is when they put that staple in, it creates a little tiny indentation. And that's where bacteria can gather and cause infection. So when they actually insert a porcupine quill, it, there is no indentation. So they're looking at the possibility of some type of medical adhesive that mimics the porcupine quill. The diabolical ironclad beetle, what a name. Isn't that a scary looking creature? Uh, he's only about, I think, an inch long. They can't fly, so they had to figure out other ways of surviving. And believe it or not, you can run over this guy with a car and he's not going to be crushed. Uh, and when you look at one of the problems we have when we join metal together, that's where the joints usually fail. And because the, uh, the juncture between the body parts of this um, beetle actually is made up of more, almost like a jigsaw geometry. And so um, designers are looking at mimicking that in uh, pull, putting together materials. This is a brand new uh, bit of information and they haven't even started designing, but it's, it's, um, it has a lot of potential. But the question is, are these products truly biomimicry? Because if you remember, um, the word sustainability was really, really key to this. Uh, and to be sustainable, we talked about you know, the inputs and the outputs. So in the chat box, would you, say, are these products truly uh, biomimicry? Are they truly sustainable? What do you think? We did have one question earlier that kind of touches on this. Yes. But does the fog collection have an effect on the local environment? You know, that is, is a question that has been asked. The same th question has been asked um, the underwater um, 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 windmills that are, producing energy through the tide. Is that slowing the water down and creating an ecosystem? These are really good questions. And we don't know yet. So this is all part of the research that has to be done that the younger generation is hopefully gonna pick up and do, and you know, continue to, to give us information. So, I mean, the question is, are these biomimicry? I don't know, I, again, I, my chat box is gone, so I'm not seeing, but really um, they're not because most of them are simply mimicking form or shape. And that's, you know, that's sort of the early form of biomimicry. And it's, it's the kindergarten level, and that's where we have to start. So that's the simplest. Uh, the next, Just what's that? One other question. How does the structural color reduce pollution when we were talking about structural color? Is it because there's no dye? Because there's no dye, but again, we're still not making it, um, the paints in a way that's sustainable, but it's a it's a kindergarten step in the in, in that direction. Um, so form is the simplest. The next level is process. Can we mimic the way things are made and the way we work, the way they work, and that is moving us in a, a closer direction. The ultimate in biomimicry is mimicking the full system, every aspect of it. And this is a picture, if you've over, been over to Omega, the OCSL, this is a, an eco machine and an eco machine mimics the way wetlands clean water. That entire building was built to be as sustainable as possible, the least amount of inputs, recyclable material, the least amount of outputs. So um, this is really the questions we have to ask in when we design, when we produce products. We're not there yet, but we're thinking about it. We're moving in that direction. And again, for the young people, uh, if you're out there, this is going to be your role. This is going to be where you're going to take us. The Backpack um, is an example of a company that is trying. They actually, as I mentioned, these are made of old tires. They are taking a waste product and using it in the design of this. So they're not going back to the planet to take out new resources. And they're also looking how every bit of water they use in the cleaning and the process is being recycled. So it's a step in the right direction. Not, no one is there yet, but one of the closest is interface carpets. If you're interested in learning about them, 
Their goal, unfortunately, we've lost Ray, their CEO, but um, their goal is to be as sustainable as possible within the te technological capabilities we have right now. And they really have gone um, quite far and they are closest to a system than any other company, Interface Carpet. So I would suggest if you're interested, you, you check them out. Uh, and also when looking at a system, it's not just uh, products, it's, it's social structures. And um, Dr. Tamsin is a social innovator and she's actually looked at biomimicry in terms of our, our structures and written two articles. How would nature elect a president or design a company? Um, really good questions, really good insight into how systems work. If you're interested in biomimicry, the place to go is this website, asknature.org. But I warn you, it is a black hole. You're going to get on there and not want to get off. Uh, lots to see. You can just type in uh, if you want to say, how does nature adhere? How does nature move? How does nature collect? Uh, it brings up all different organisms that you can learn about. And it's not just to go to, to learn about organisms. If when scientists, um, biologists learn something new about organism, it's an open source site. They can go in and add this information that will help designers in the future. So asknature.org, highly recommend it. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio is a really big biomimicry supporter and his funding developed this wonderful video, it's short, on the promise of biomimicry. And I would highly recommend it, especially to young people, because they talk about something in there that I'll mention in a minute. We are very fortunate to have this uh, Omega uh, nearby. The OCSL is a really an active living example of biomimicry. So if you, if you don't know, they give tours when they're open uh, on Wednesdays and Saturdays of the, uh, of the OCSL and talk about it, really recommend it. For young people and also for us seniors, we need to know that biomimicry is rapidly growing and within 10 years, almost every job, every discipline is gonna have some form of biomimicry in it. And I love telling the story. I had a group of seniors and they were sitting in an auditorium and there were a couple that were totally not interested in this program. And I asked them why and they, and they said, well, you know, I'm gonna be a model, I'm going into fashion. I said, well, funny you should say that. And I talked about um, the nature of fashion and, and makeup and biomimicry is already very actively being utilized in these areas and more areas every day. I just threw this in because I, I love this. I saw this today on my Facebook post. Uh, asked our children what problems we want to solve. That's really what we want to look at. Look at what's out there, what are the problems, and how can we redesign them so they're no longer problems. Um, this, for our young people who are out there, the Biomimicry Youth Design Challenge is a great way to learn about biomimicry and to start thinking about design. They have three levels. The first they did was college, and if you're a college student and, and um, have a team that enter and you do win, your winning design is actually, you're going to be linked up with designers, engineers, um, lawyers uh, for patents. The Institute, along with Ray Anderson's Ray, uh, Ray of Hope Foundation, fund this, the winning project, to become an actual product. But we wanted to introduce young people earlier. So we started with the high school and now we're down to the middle school. Um, uh, either a teacher with her class or his class or a club or even a group of private kids. La in 2018, I co-coached along with um, two other mothers in Rhinebeck, a team of middle school students and we won. <laughs> we took first place in the middle school level. It was so incredible. Um, and this experience changed some of these kids' lives. So the design challenge is, is a wonderful way. Here's, here's our winning team. Uh, you can read about them if you just uh, Google Biomimicry Youth Design Challenge winners. This was 2018. Uh, we're looking, I'm trying to get another team together. I'd love to do high school students, but I put out feelers, but I haven't gotten any response back. Uh, how does biomimicry inspire young people? Well, many years ago, I did a presentation to fifth graders and I was actually had left the classroom of was getting ready to leave the building and the teacher came running down the hall. She says, Dorna, I have to give this to you. This little girl from a one hour program on biomimicry designed a product. Her grandfather 
has Alzheimer's and he was leaving the house and getting lost. And so she designed slug slippers. Why? Because slugs leave a slime trail. That way her grandfather could find his way home. A one hour program. That's the, the inspiration, the amazing uh, experience of biomimicry. Um, I have real quick, I know we're almost to the end here. Um, I have written a children's series called How an Idea from Nature Changed Our World. We're gonna raffle the Velcro story off tonight. Um, I just finished my second book. It's at the printers now. Um, it's a story of eco machines. So there's the cover and you'll recognize if you've been to Omega, there's, the, there's that. There's a lot of material out there for young people on biomimicry. So I can't see your faces, but some of you may be getting a little wigged out right now looking at this uh, picture. Uh, and that's often how when people look at organisms in the natural world, they, you know, they get wigged out and their first response is kill it. My hope through this program and through learning about biomimicry and these organisms, rather you might become inspired and ask questions about it. And I purposely, and again, this wigs out a lot of people too, uh, I purposely use this because you see how this beetle is attaching and holding on to the hands. Uh, if, you held, if this person held up his hand, this beetle would not fall off and yet he's not puncturing the body at all. So there are designers looking at how can we make something that would attach the wall so we don't have to put nails in them. So that is biomimicry. I would love to answer any questions you have and hear any input. Again, I'm, I'm doing this, I feel like I'm just talking to myself. Um, would love to hear any questions. Maybe we can. Um, we have one that was in the chat box. Would leeches on wounds be considered a form of biomimicry? No, that's bioutilization because you're using it. Uh, in, in mimicry, if we could mimic how they take the blood out of the body without puncturing or how they stick to, then that would be biomimicry. Good question. Right. Other questions? We actually have a question. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. And, and I apologize, my camera is not working right now, but um, for someone who has no background in design, uh, I'm a photographer, but this is a subject that's always really interested me. Um, is there something you could recommend, like um, a good place to start or whether it's a book to read or a program to look into um, for someone with zero design background? Well, I would definitely look at the promise of biomimicry. Okay. Um, yes, there are quite a few books out. And if you go onto the Ask Nature site, there is a resource section. The other thing I didn't mention is that there are doctoral programs of biomimicry. There's now a master's program and they're moving it down to a, a bachelor program at the uh, Arizona State University. And there's um, two colleges in Great Lakes area, the Cleveland area. One is a design institute, one is a science school. And they have a program that they partnered up together. They have a program uh, that brings all those students together in studying biomimicry. So there, and there's also workshops. Um, Tamsin, you saw, she offers a workshop for social innovation uh, out in New Mexico every year. I'm not, I was actually supposed to take it this year and obviously it didn't happen. So we're, I'm looking forward to next year. So there's more, and I, I run biomimicry workshops for teachers. I run biomimicry programs for, for students um, in schools. So there's a lot out there. And there's some great kids books too. That's very helpful. Thank you for those recommendations. Thank you so much, Donna. That was so much fun. I think everybody really got a lot out of that. You're welcome. Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. I love talking biomimicry. <laughs>